actually a component of the tunica intima. So I'm going to add this here, the internal elastic lamina. And we still have a loose irregular connective tissue. And then we have our tunica media without the elastic fiber sheets. All right, so in the muscular artery, the tunica media is not going to have might be an occasional elastic fiber, but not the prominent sheets. So this would be the tunica media here. You can see an occasional elastic stain in there. I can anyway bring it close, but not whole sheets of them. <laughs> and then we would have the tunica externa. The dark blue are collagen fibers. So loss of the sheets of elastic fiber, addition of the internal elastic lamina. I did mention it to my lecture this morning, but there's also an external elastic lamina between the tunica media and the tunica externa. You don't need to worry about that, but the accuracy sake is there. that it's an arterial, all right? That's the classification I use based on a histology class that I taught. You might, if you Google this or Bing search or whatever internet search, and you put in arterial, you will find images labeled, or blood vessels labeled, labeled arterials that are three or four muscle cells thick. If I show that to you in a lab quiz or an exam, it will be an artery. It has to have only one or two smooth muscle cells in the tunica media be a, to fit the uh, classification of arterial that I use. All right. So let's change this now to arterial. I spelled it this way this morning. Nobody corrected me until I looked at it and went, wait a minute. arterial in your lecture notes is one that's cut in longitudinal section. So you will see cross sections through the muscle cells rather than longitudinal sections. It will have a regular tunica intima. So I'm going to draw this a little larger than it would be in proportion just so it's visible. squamous epithelial cell. We've lost that corrugated look because we don't have the internal elastic lamina. We still have loose irregular connective tissue. However, the tunica media will have just one maybe two layers of smooth muscle. Okay? I'll write that. Because there are so many arterials in comparison to even small arteries, this makes the arterial the site of the autonomic control of blood pressure. So next week when we talk about blood pressure, if we decrease the diameter of an arterial in half, we increase the resistance by four. So 
when we talk about prayers, in other words, I don't know how many grew up with the magic school bus, but my kids did. And there was a show on re re uh, resistance where they had the kids playing baseball on an ice skating rink. And of course, they're able to slide faster than they could run. Um, so if I were to take the scissors, you know, slide them across the table, it's peripheral resistance between the scissors and the surface of the table that slows it down and eventually causes it to stop. All right. So if I have a blood vessel of this diameter, and I have the same amount of that's our artery, or and I have the same amount of blood flowing in, I don't know, ten. nine, eight arterioles, the volume is the same, but there's an increased amount of surface area. So there's going to be more resistance. Because I still have some smooth muscle, I can decrease this diameter much more than I can decrease that diameter. So the arterial becomes the vessel of regulation of blood pressure through the sympathetic nervous system, as we'll see next week, causing constriction or dilation. There's always a slight tone. So when blood pressure drops, the vessels will dilate. When blood pressure constricts, I mean, when blood pressure rises, the blood vessels constrict. So if you're scared, your face doesn't get red, it gets pale. Okay? So at the same time, we're constricting blood supply to the skin via the arterioles. We're dilating arterioles in the skeletal muscle to increase blood flow to the skeletal muscle. So we'll look at that effect on blood pressure next week. But I want you to recognize that that is the major function of the arterioles. So arteries in general are function as our pressure reservoir. We need to increase or decrease blood pressure. That's where we uh, change parameters. All right, now let's remove even the smooth muscle. So we'll have no smooth muscle, all right? And we'll have no tunica externa. We don't have any smooth muscle. And the vessel we're left with is identified as a capillary. So it's formed only of simple squamous epithelia. It may take one, two, or three simple squamous epithelia to form that wall. Attaching the epithelia to each other. Capillary. Capillary. Attaching the epithelia to each other are tight junctions. And as you recall from the brain, the more tight junctions we have, the smaller the molecules are that can pass in or out of the vessel. And we have the blood-brain barrier. Antibiotics don't cross the blood-brain barrier. Dopamine doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So we can have leaky or tight um, capillaries. And in your lecture notes, as well as on the PowerPoint slide, there are three types of capillaries um, that are illustrated. So this would be a typical capillary over okay. here. Endothelial cell is our name for the epithelium lining blood vessels. Here's one cell, here's another, and that they're junctions. Uh, they're joined by tight junctions. Every epithelium, remember, has a basement membrane. It's one of the characteristics of epithelia. And so if there's a full basement membrane present, it's identified as a continuous capillary. Full or complete basement membrane. Hang on, we'll change that to complete. If the basement membrane is incomplete, if it's patchy, like you see on the lower, left, lower diagram here, it is called a discontinuous capillary. Mm 
And we usually see this in sites where capillaries are present that large molecules need to pass across the membrane. So in this one, you can see there's large spaces in the membrane and between the capillary cells. We find this type of a capillary in the bone marrow or in the liver where red blood cells move in and out or white blood cells that are newly formed in the bone marrow. And so a very large capillary uh, like that is also known as a sinusoid. So capillaries are typically slightly larger than a red blood cell. Anybody remember the diameter of a red blood cell? It's about seven microns. So this is going to be between seven and nine microns in diameter. A typical capillary, whereas a sinusoid may be 10 to 12. So in a typical regular capillary, what it caught having such a small diameter causes the blood flow to slow down and the cap the red blood cells have to travel one by one. Kind of stack up. And that slows it down and gives more time for gas exchange. Right. So the oxygen that's moving out of the air sacs and the lungs has more time to enter into the red blood cell and more of it. And if it's in the tissues, there's more time for the oxygen to leave and shorter distance. Okay, so now up here, you'll notice that it has a continuous capillary, a basement membrane, and the cells have small channels in them. And those are known as fenestrations, fenestra, or pores. So this is specifically an example of a capillary in the kidney. We'll talk about it where it functions in filtration. So both the basement membrane affecting charges and the size of those pores determine what leaves the blood. So in other words, in the kidney, ions, individual amino acids, can pass out of the capillary, but proteins and red blood cells are too large. All right, so that uh, this is affecting transport across the membrane. Now, let's take our capillaries, and now we're going to join them back together again and form cushion. BM is basement membrane, okay. not your typical child toddler BM, it's basement membrane. <laughs> so once we bring our capillaries back together and we're taking five or six capillaries and forming a common channel, that is identified as a venule, but specifically a post-capillary venule. There are no pre-capillary venules. So we're distinguishing a post-capillary venule from larger venules closer to the heart. Post-capillary venules are just like capillaries in appearance. They're, all, they're just larger in size. So a post-capillary venule is going to be more like a sinusoid, but because of its relationship distal to the capillary bed, we don't call it a sinusoid. So this could be 12 to 15 microns in diameter. The key element here is the, still the continuation of a lack of smooth muscle and a decrease in the number of tight junctions. Post-capillary venules are leaky. There's actually gaps that can occur, especially in the presence of histamine and some of the chemicals released by macrophages when pathogens occur. And white blood cells attracted to that area of infection will leave the post-capillary venule through this method. Anybody remember what this is called? When white blood cells change shape, kind of squeeze out of a blood vessel. You learned it in Bio 430 with the chapter on skin specifically inflammation and wound healing. Diabetes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded really heartfelt. So diapodesis is the process by which white blood cells change from their round shape to 
be able to squeeze through an opening in post-capillary venules. And this happens whenever you have an infection or an inflammation. White blood cells travel in the blood, but they do their work in the connective tissue. And this is how they get to the connective tissue. So I want you to recognize that post-capillary venules are where that takes place. So now as our venules join together and form larger venules, we're looking at the structure of veins. So we go, we start adding back a little bit of smooth muscle, a little bit of connective tissue, kind of go in reverse. 